Good day, this is Dr. T and welcome to my computer screen. Uh, so this is a little bit different of an office hours episode, but uh, yeah, hopefully it goes well. Anyways, so this is a gas simulator from PHET. Uh, they've got a lot of great educational resources. I totally recommend you checking them out, uh, if only for fun. Uh, so in this case, uh, we'll be simulating a gas and talking about kind of the key properties of gases. Uh, the understanding of gases centers around what we call the kinetic molecular theory. And to show this, uh, probably should get some gases then. So I'll say what it does or do what it says and put some gas in by pushing the handle. Okay, so kinetic molecular theory of gases says that gases are comprised of particles. Uh, that these particles bounce around, they're in motion. So the molecular part is the fact that they're in particles, whether it be molecules or um, atoms. Uh, ions as well, but once you're getting a lot of ions, you're really starting to move in more the plasma field. But, you know, you can have ions, you know, that's totally possible. And so they're bouncing around, that's the kinetic part. And uh, there's kind of two ways of looking at gases, uh, what we call an ideal gas and a real gas. The ideal gas uh, has a couple of assumptions. It's assuming that as those particles bounce around, then they're going to bounce off of each other. It's completely an elastic collision, and it, it, you know, it's like billiard balls bouncing. No energy is lost. They don't stick to each other, basically. Uh, the other assumption, uh, which is clearly not the case in this particular simulator, is that the volume of the particles really small. It's uh, really negligible. So that uh, the volume of the container is the volume that they have to bounce around. Now, obviously, these particles are large enough that that's not really uh, a valid assumption in this case. And this is definitely a real gas. Uh, what you'll end up finding is I'm going to talk about ideal gases uh, and then we can use some equations to start linking properties. Real gases will add a couple of different um, constants uh, depending on what the gas particle is. The nice part about ideal gases though is that those two assumptions under normal conditions are good enough. They're not perfectly true, but they're close enough to being valid that you could run with it. And that actually is why as chemists, we're talking about ideal gases and gases and not as physicists, which they still talk about them. But the goal here is, or at least the origin here, is that um, with these gases, you could start to understand more about molecules than um, what you could otherwise, because you need to start out easy, you need to start out simple. And so, it usually doesn't matter. The gas properties that we're going to be describing doesn't matter what kind of chemical you have as long as you're an ideal gas. If you're a real gas, it does matter. Those, there's correction constants that do change uh, depending on what that chemical is. Uh, but this allowed us, to, uh, jumping off part, to really start understanding chemistry uh, because it allowed us to simplify a whole lot of things. Okay, so when it comes to gases, there's really you know, basically four key properties, and you're seeing all of them on the screen right now, although one of them is a little bit um, less obvious. Uh, so I've already talked about volume, and that's the volume that the gas particles have to bounce around it. And once again, that, that would be you know, the size of your container in an ideal gas, uh, the size of the container less the volume occupied by the gas particles in a real gas. So once again, throw in a constant uh, if necessary. And it's gonna be measured in any volume unit you'd like. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, liters are popular but you don't have to. You could use acre feet if you wanted. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could. Uh, and of course, in this particular case, you know, our little guy could shrink the container, etc. And as you notice, uh, these properties are going to be related. So the temperature and the pressure just went up. So let's talk about temperature. Um, you obviously know what temperature is, uh, but just kind of to, to flush things out. If you look at these guys, they're bouncing around. Some are bouncing around faster than others. You're always going to have this kind of Gaussian distribution. If you plotted the, the velocities of all of these things, uh, they would, some would be going very quickly, some would be going very slowly, and a bunch would be going kind of medium speed. Um, now, of course, that's a heavy species, and I can add a light species, and the light ones are going faster, because temperature is really describing much more of the, the average kinetic energy. That's an imperfect definition, 
Uh, there's more going on, but that is a more than adequate working definition of temperature, the average kinetic energy of your particles. Uh, once again, it's not perfect. Um, there are definitely folks that upon hearing this would just be pulling their hair out and screaming, but no, it's, it's a, definitely a workable definition. Uh, for most anything is, most chemists will do. Obviously, for some folks, it's not good enough, but that's because they got specialized work. Uh, now, the other thing I'd like to point out is just, you notice there's a bunch of atoms in there, or a bunch of blue and red circles. Uh, the next property, and I'm leaving pressure to the end for a reason you'll see here shortly. Uh, the next property is going to be just how many you've got of there. Uh, and so that property is, you know, usually measured in moles. Just how much gas do you have in your container? Uh, you could measure that with any count. I mean, you could use dozens, you could use individual atoms, but both of those are ludicrously too small for any kind of real world application. So mole is the only practical number you can use. Uh, one other quick kind of backtrack when it comes to temperature. You notice how that one's in Kelvin. Uh, Temperature is describing that average kinetic energy. Uh, you don't want to be using a relative scale. Celsius or Fahrenheit are both relative scales. So if you try and use either of those, they'll have a zero in them. And when you try and use the temperature in any of our equations, they blow up and they go negative when you go below freezing, and it just doesn't make a lick of sense. Um, it would sort of make sense if it was water. It doesn't. It's still the math doesn't work. Uh, because really you need to be describing that average kinetic energy and having a relative scale with a zero just arbitrarily plump someplace in, you know, your scale doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, it's not zero at that point and you don't have negative energy. Um, so you have to use what we call an absolute scale. An absolute scale puts the zero at absolute zero, the point where the motion of the particles is it's actually not zero, but we're going to pretend it's zero. Um, so the point where they've, they've really settled out and it cannot get any colder. All of their thermal energy is gone. Uh, and then you, you know, you go up uh, in temperature that way. There's two relative scale, or sorry, two absolute scales. Each one's mirrored off the relative scale. So the one we always use, the one that's used here is Kelvin. By the way, there is no degree sign in Kelvin. Uh, complaint on, on the light bulb boxes. Uh, but anyways, you've got Kelvin uh, that starts at absolute zero, uses centigrade units, and goes up. Uh, conversion between centigrade and Kelvin, centigrade plus 273.15, if you feel like it. Uh, so centigrade plus 273.15 gives you Kelvin, because absolute zero is negative 273.15 centigrade. Alternatively, uh, you could use, no one does, but you could use the other scale, which is ranking. Uh, in that case, it's exactly the same idea as Kelvin, but instead of using centigrade units, you use Fahrenheit units. Um, obviously, you know, in certain circle, circles, it took a little bit longer to move on to, to the SI system than others. Uh, so in that case, you can use rankings. That's 400 and some odd uh, degrees plus your Fahrenheit. Once again, I'm used to the SI system. Uh, so yeah, you got yourself your temperature. So that leaves you really the last unit, and that last unit is pressure, and the pressure is a little bit more interesting. Pressure, you notice how those particles are slamming against the size of the container. Uh, that fundamentally is pressure. It's the amount of force being pushed or exerted on your container um, by the particles that are bouncing around within it. Um, yeah, so, you know, you imagine getting hit in the face with a ping pong ball. That would be annoying. Uh, but at a certain point, you're just getting hit in the face by a bunch of ping pong balls. It's no longer individual strikes. It's not just kind of a force pushing on you. Uh, and that's basically the same idea for these gas particles. Now, there's a couple of different ways uh, you can measure pressure, so there's a couple of different ways of doing units. Uh, the simplest way it would be to have a little pusher plate, have no gas particles behind it, or have a known amount, and then the amount of force that you push on the plate, maybe accounting for any gas particles bouncing on the other side, uh, would be your pressure. So in this case, your units are going to be in terms of the size of the plate, so area, and in terms of force. So it would be force divided by area. Uh, the two common ones 
would be the pounds per square inch, which is exactly what it sounds like, uh, PSI. Uh, so that's going to be the force in pounds and the area in square inches. Um, and we use that quite a bit. Uh, normal kind of everyday pressure at sea level is uh, 15 PSI, 14.7, just a smidgen under 15. Um, so yeah, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, by the way, what we the other way of thinking about normal pressure is what we call one atmosphere. So the pressure at sea level is defined as one atmosphere or ATM, and that's actually what they've shown here. Uh, it's a very very popular unit. So twice sea level would be two ATM, that kind of thing. Uh, but back to force. The SI unit of force is the Pascal. The Pascal is going to be the uh, Force in newtons, which is not a particularly large unit of force, and the area in square meters, which is a particularly large uh, unit of force, or sorry, large unit of area. Uh, so, one atmosphere, once again, the normal sea level pressure is going to be 100, 1000 and some change pascals. Okay, that's large enough that we're going to use kilopascals for anything we normally use. So the SI unit is going to be kilopascals. Uh, effectively, it's really the pascal, but usually we're going to use the kilopascal. Uh, and it's, you know, it's 101 and a little bit extra for, once again, that normal one atmosphere. Now there's one more unit, uh, the bar, which gets used quite a bit. And the bar is defined as 100 kilopascals. So once again, it's, it's based off of the force uh, per area, but a little bit more indirectly. Okay, so we talked about the atmosphere as its own special unit, uh, which is actually one of the more popular ones. So you see bars a lot, you'll see pascals, PSI is pretty common. Atmosphere is great, because it's easy to think about. Okay, half an atmosphere, well, that's half of what I'm used to. Kind of scenario. Now, there is one more way to measure pressure that is... Um, kind of creative, um, and we use this because it's actually a really straightforward and a great way of doing it. So what you can do is you take a liquid and you put it in an evacuated tube um, with the top end closed and the bottom end submerged in more of that liquid. So it's basically like pulling up a straw, but it's got a vacuum at one end. Now, when you suck on a straw, uh, you don't actually pull the liquid into your mouth. You don't pull your soda or your Slurpee or whatever into your mouth. You decrease the pressure inside your mouth, and then the air pushing on the surface of the Slurpee or the soda or the whatever pushes it down and then up through the straw. So this is going to work in basically the same way. The, the fluid in question is pushed down, and it goes up into the evacuated tube. The higher up the tube it goes, the higher the pressure outside of it. Now, uh, if you were to use something like water, you would need a really long tube. Uh, so we want to use something that's a lot more dense than water. And hey, mercury is a liquid and it's dense, so we usually use mercury. So from this we can measure pressure in how high up the mercury goes, and you can really use any distance unit you want. Uh, you will see inches of mercury quite common for the non-SI approaches, uh, but kind of the standard one as chemists will use is millimeters of mercury, mmHg, uh, or we'll use TOR, which is slightly different definition, but effectively the exact same thing. So T-O-R-R, -R, TOR, uh, is a millimeter of mercury, uh, which it is a lot easier to say. Okay, so we've got our units, and we can do a couple of things with them. Um, one, you'll notice that as I change these units, uh, they all change. They're all interconnected. So we can set up a equation where we set up uh, the beginning units to start with. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll call P1, we'll call ones to start with. Uh, P1, V1 over T1, N1. N is the number of moles. Uh, I think the other ones are pretty self-explanatory. T for temperature, P for pressure, um, V for volume. 
And then we can set that equal to after the change. So P2, B2 over T2 into. And then plug in our numbers. If one of the numbers doesn't change, so if, say, temperature doesn't change during the change, we can just omit temperature from both sides. They, they'd be the same, so they cancel out algebraically. And so if we know all of the ones that changed except one, we can do some algebra, bada boom, bada bang, to solve for what you don't know. Alternatively, uh, what we can do is we can kind of set that up. And if you have a container, and you know the pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles, because gases behave very regularly, at least if they are ideal gases, then that fraction is actually always going to be the same thing. It will depend on what units you have, but they will always solve for the same number if you use those same units. So the solution to that fraction we call the gas constant, and uh, that gets the abbreviation R, don't really know why R was picked, other than it's not a particularly heavily used letter, so at least it's convenient. So then we can uh, set up an equation like that. We usually rearrange it so that it is written PV equals NRT, mnemonic is PIVNER. And then in that case, once again, if you know three of the four variables, then you know the fourth one, uh, and thus you can figure out what's going on with your material. And yeah, um, that's if you have an ideal gas. If you have a real gas, so you can't make those assumptions, you throw in a couple of constants that adjust for the um, uh, interactions of the particles. Um, and then in that case, you look up what those constants are in a table somewhere, because you know what your gas is, at least hopefully, otherwise you're up a creek. Uh, those are different. Those constants are different depending on what your chemical is. And then, yeah, you run the equation. Now, with that said, there's only one more part, and I would like to call your attention to looking at the container. Let's see if I can find the mouse. Uh, notice how you got the blue and the red balls hitting. Um, you've got a mixture of gases, and you can do a rather interesting quirk. I could imagine taking an identical container, you know, control C, control V, and in one container, I've got my red particles. The other container, I've got my uh, blue particles. I think those are blue. Uh, and they're bouncing around. And if I did that, uh, the volumes would be the same. Remember, it's an identical container. Uh, they'd have the same average kinetic energy, so the temperature would be the same. Uh, obviously, the numbers would be different. And if I think about it, there would be less of them, so there would be less collisions. So the pressure would be different. And if I were to add the two numbers together, they would add up to what's currently in there. And if I were to add up the pressures, then those would add together. And that's actually our last gas law. It's Dalton's law of partial pressures. And in this case, what you can do is you can look at a mixture of gases and say that the total pressure, the thing that an actual pressure gauge would measure, uh, is the sum of the pressure being contributed to that by each of the gases in the mixture. This is actually quite important to us uh, because chemical reactions occur with collisions. Pressure is really describing those collisions. So chemical reactions are, are not sensitive to the total pressure of a gas. They're sensitive to the partial pressure of it. A uh, higher partial pressure of gas uh, is going to allow for quicker chemical reactions if that gas is involved. Uh, that would be, you know, the origins of things like the Apollo 1 fire. They were breathing pure oxygen. Uh, the partial pressure was much, much, much higher than it would have been under normal conditions. When a spark from a, shall we say, not as well safety vehicle as one would hope, uh, landed uh, what under normal atmospheric conditions would have just gone it erupted and killed the three astronauts. Uh, of course, we see that with the emphysema patients, and actually that's the whole point of wearing oxygen containers, because if your lungs don't work well, uh, because they've been damaged or whatnot, then the higher purity oxygen increases the partial pressure of the oxygen, allowing it to transverse across the uh, uh, lungs into the blood. 
Uh, additionally, as chemists, we can use partial pressures um, to our advantage. If we do a gas collection, we collect it over water. Then uh, for liquid or things that are evaporating, so things that are you know right next to their liquid, they're in equilibrium with their liquid. Uh, partial pressure is dictated by the temperature. Uh, and so we can look that up in a table and we can say, hey, we bubbled this gas through water, use that to trap the gas in a water trap. And thus we can figure out the partial pressure of the gas we trap by taking the total pressure, which is presumably atmospheric pressure uh, once you adjust the water levels and subtracting off the partial pressure of the water that would have been in that gas because it's right over water. So it, it's going to be, you know, a nice equilibrium, super humid in there. Okay, so with that said, um, hope this helps. Have fun and have a wonderful day.